Dr. Serrato, Enrico Serrato, it's a pleasure having you here today for, for the interview. And uh, you are to be congratulated on a very nice uh, paper in, um, in, the, in the journal uh, Future Cardiology, um, where you describe in the beginning, of course, all the physiologic indices from the non-hyperemic wire-based pressure ratios and um, were, and of course, also the uh, the non-hyperemic, uh, the CT-based FFR by heart flow, and final, uh, finally also the um, NGO-based solutions, and um, the QFR is one of those solutions. Um, you have described uh, also extensively the uh, QFR principles and, and also the acquisition techniques, and it's, uh, it's very important to measure, uh, and that's also what you write, mm -hmm. that the quality, of course, of the data determines uh, to a great extent the quality of the QFR analysis. And um, th I believe there are some simple guidelines there to follow, and, and there's even a QFR wizard. And, um, and then my, my first question here is, uh, um, do you feel restricted by the guideline, or is it simple to follow? I, um, I often hear also that uh, if you follow the guidelines, and in general, in clinical practice also the the quality of the angiograms over time improve but i'm i'm really eager to hear to uh, hear your experiences with uh, say the the guidelines and how to acquire the data okay thank you for your kind invitation yes with uh, this review paper we would like to summarize the current knowledge on these amazing technologies that uh, we start to use and um, yes, following your uh, first question, I think that uh, uh, it's very important also for young interventional cardiology to learn how to perform a good uh, angiography. And in this case, uh, the QFR uh, is uh, something that uh, could be very useful each other to learn uh, how, to good, uh, uh, how to make a, a good acquisition. Uh, like uh, avoiding uh, panning, avoiding a superimposition of the uh, different vessel. And so probably uh, also for young people could be a, a good uh, chance to learn better how to uh, use angiography to judge the um, coronary stenosis because this is uh, the, the basic principle of the of QFR computation. The best you uh, acquire the images uh, and the easier will be the your your analysis with the QFR uh, software. Yeah, yeah. Well, great to hear that. You also described, of course, I mean, you made a, a very extensive overview, the, the clinical trials that have been carried out, and certainly we are now in, in the process of the FIFA 3 uh, outcomes uh, trial in 2000 patients, as you know, which is uh, on the way and you will be part of that uh, trial as well. Now, suppose also, and that is what we expect, that the study really shows that the QFR is non-inferior to the FFR. And, and uh, will that be then the start of uh, using QFR in daily clinical practice? Um, and and do we have any idea? Will that be the moment that it will be included in the in the clinical guidelines? Uh, yes, we we expect this uh, result. We hope to reach uh, this result because this could be a, a good uh, signal, a good uh, fact for uh, any interventionalist because uh, we, in this way we can count. Uh, on uh, another technique uh, that is uh, comparable and similar to FFR or other physiological indices uh, that we can uh, use in uh, our daily practice and uh, we can uh, we can use to um, to obtain more information that could be pre PCI post PCI for the outcome uh, in terms of microcirculation that could be uh, used in several uh, way. As any technology, uh, we have to be aware that uh, we cannot uh, uh, use this technology in any case because there is uh, currently some uh, limitations that we have to, 
to know about this technology, but it's uh, the same uh, thing that uh, when we have to advance uh, a wire in the coronary and uh, like it's impossible to advance the wire because it's uh, too tortuous the vessel. So any technique could have uh, some limitation, but um, having uh, some uh, good result from clinical trial could be the starting point to start uh, to use uh, in uh, everyday clinical practice uh, and to um, to, uh, to to use it uh, with in more faster uh, fashion as possible. Excellent. Yeah, very happy to hear that, of course. And um, yeah, you have been uh, participating in um, and also, as I learned, also working with uh, Professor Escanet in Madrid, where you spent a year. You also describe um, the, the the fire trial, of course, that is uh, uh, Italian um, uh, initiated by Professor Campo and executed in Italy, uh, Spain, and Poland. And um, do you know more about the trial? Well, when will it be finished? You think? And what do you expect also from that trial for the daily clinical practice? It's a, a trial in 75 plus age people. So what, what will happen then? Yes, we are actually good news because we are still, um, we are uh, reaching now the patient 1000 enrolled. We are like uh, this morning 988 patients. Okay. So it's, uh, it's a very it's a good pleasure to be a part of this project here in uh, in the two centers where I work in here in, uh, in Italy, in Rivoli Hospital and San Luigi Gonzaga Hospital. And um, uh, yes, the uh, finishment of the enrollment uh, is probably uh, um, will be in uh, next uh, August, according to the current plan of enrollment of patients. And so we will uh, have some uh, results in uh, 2000 and 22 probably and I think that could be important because it's the first uh, trial that is uh, uh, focusing on patient, on older patient uh, with more than 75 uh, years that could be a, a, a group of patients that in daily practice is uh, growing more and more and in which, pro we, in which we could have some um, uh, we can have some um, question we can uh, have to discuss with a clinician about uh, to um, to complete or not when we find a, a non-culprit uh, bystander lesion so it's a, a group of patients in which uh, this trial I think uh, could um, provide the important answer in the everyday in everyday practice in such uh, complex population of uh, all the older uh, patient that is uh, that will be grow in the next future right like now yeah yeah now very happy to hear that uh, coming close to the to patient 1000 i mean it's yes. a, a major achievement and yes. i think the total study is uh, 14 or 1500 patients so indeed if that can be uh, completed this year around uh, mid this year that will be uh, would be fantastic uh, yeah, it was not, not easy to to go on with the enrollment uh, given the the lockdown, but uh, we all, all the centers are uh, are very enthusiastic, and uh, we we will try to to do our our best. The study is, uh, is simple, and uh, we we enrolled the last patient uh, just uh, this morning, and so it's uh, it's very. It's very simple, easy to to go on with this trial, but uh, we have also to deal with uh, this critical moment uh, worldwide. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Now I understand that uh, certainly now with the COVID, it makes everything makes a, a lot more complicated and, and slows down things. But uh, making gr good progress despite these uh, these limitations. Mm, yes. Um, in your paper, you also described the use of QFR in specific settings, eh, such as acute coronary syndromes, uh, particularly for the non culprit lesions, in the setting of post-PCI, uh, where, um, of course, uh, the team of uh, uh, Professor Campo has also done this Hawkeye study. 
And um, can you tell us something more about the, the value and where post PCR QFR plays a major role? But um, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about that? Because that is also a, a major step in um, establishing a certain value post PCI. Mm. Yeah, the the Okai study uh, analyzed uh, uh, a, a large uh, number of uh, of patients uh, in the post PCI setting in all comers patient and uh, come to the conclusion that uh, this cutoff of uh, 0 0.89 could be uh, used to have uh, more information about uh, the probability of. Uh, uh, vessel related uh, events uh, during a follow up. And uh, as you know, in the last year, this topic uh, is, uh, is growing. And also in the other indices like FFR, IFR, is, um, the, the investigators try, is, is, is moving on in order to know more about uh, the possibility to uh, to tell to the patient uh, something about uh, the final result of the PCI to to go to be beyond the uh, angiographic result to provide uh, some uh, some other uh, stratification of the risk of the patient. So I think that uh, this uh, the use of QFR could be a um, valuable tool in this setting because you do not need uh, for instance, uh, to have uh, a, a, a wire, to open a wire, to use a wire, even at the end of a complex long PCI, for example. And you can also try to analyze uh, uh, post uh, PCI at the end of the procedure, uh, your final result, uh, just to provide uh, some additional information uh, in terms of prognosis uh, to your patient. So, uh, this, uh, this study demonstrates uh, that uh, it could be possible to analyze uh, QFR systematically post uh, PCI. And so, um, just to mention your first uh, question, it could be important to standardize the acquisition of uh, some angiographic view at the end of the uh, procedure. Uh, also, in order to use uh, this, uh, this tool, if, uh, if it is uh, available in specifically in, uh, in your center. Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, excellent. Um, um, we, we always um, see the QFR as a alternative for the FFR, but as you know, we also provide uh, uh, 3D QCA, basically. We have length of stenosis, we have uh, uh, the, 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 the reference diameter, there we also have the possibility to prioritize serial lesions. There is a possibility to uh, also to look at the residual QFR. So what, what would you expect in terms of QFR of the vessel when you stand a certain lesion? How, how useful are these also 3D QCA, stand sizing basically, serial lesions? Do you use that in, cl in clinical practice? Or do you do that on still uh, uh, your visual interpretation? Uh, I think that it depends more, more and more um, if you can count also on uh, other people that are involved with this technology, like uh, technicians, like uh, fellows, like uh, other people that uh, help you during the procedure because it is uh, like an online process of uh, QFR. So I think the first step for any uh, cat lab that would like to use this technology is uh, start with uh, normal analysis. Then when you feel uh, confident with this technology and uh, also uh, all the people working in the cat lab are uh, very used to uh, know very well this technology, you can also uh, add these uh, all these features that could be very very good to to guide your uh, your PCI. But I think that uh, it will uh, it, it will be an ongoing process of uh, learning how to use uh, these uh, these technologies. So 
uh, we are uh, using uh, these features in a limited part of our daily practice. Uh, depending also how busy is our our mm -hmm. day. So I think in the future probably also other uh, software or other technological improve, improvement of this technology will help uh, in uh, online use uh, of these uh, tools uh, in uh, in the cat lab. That could be very important, like we know for the pullback of uh, IFR or implementation of FFR with other um, co-registration tool, so it's uh, an evolving technology, I, I mean. Yeah, uh, and that is also, again, uh, you could say a, a challenge for us to make it as simple as, as possible and to also provide the data to you in a, in a readily available format so that you can, um, can, can use that information to, uh, to, to determine on the next, next steps in, your, in the treatment. And, and that is also uh, an approach that we are taking every, we are continuously looking at uh, ways to simplify, improve workflow, uh, provide the data more readily um, available to you. And of course, very important to get your, to get your feedback also on that. Um, another question that I would like to raise is we mentioned already, or you mentioned about the microvasculatory disease. And it is possible that um, that, that post PCI that the value still remains below 0.8, and and then there may be uh, it may be due to limitation in in the stent placement. But it's also possible that the microcirculatory disease is um, is the issue, and um, and of course um, in in the future we uh, we will provide also a an approach to assess through the QFR also, uh, or an additional measurement, a value of the, um, of the microcirculatory uh, status of the patient. And, and I think that will most likely um, uh, help you also in determining whether you need to, to look back at the vessel, do an additional stenting or post dilatation or whatever, but that there is, uh, uh, if the value be remains below 0.8, then the patient still has chest pain and that may be just the uh, microcirculatory issue. So that uh, I suppose that will be also very helpful in the further treatment of, uh, of your patients. So yes, I, I think that uh, um, the possibility to use a QFR is a part of uh, a worldwide effort to move from uh, epicardial stenosis to the microvascular uh, beds. Uh, because um, from the time being, we are uh, very used uh, to consider the use of physiology only for the epicardial stenosis, but uh, surely it will be very interesting to know more about uh, what is uh, what is happen, uh, happening in the microvascular uh, beds, uh, even during the during the PCI or uh, after the PCI. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, any tools that work in this direction will be uh, useful in the in the future. Probably now we have uh, other tools like uh, dedicated wires with a Doppler or um, or uh, with uh, other way to uh, obtain information from the microcirculation. So the the possibility to extrapolate this information from uh, QFR uh, will be very, very interesting. I think that when any interventionalist uh, at the end of the PCI uh, use uh, like uh, physiological indices and uh, obtain a, a bad value like uh, below 0 0.80, it's uh, something that uh, is, uh, um, in most cases not easy to explain and uh, the interventional cardiology is not happy about uh, know this, uh, that the result of the PCI seems not uh, to reflect uh, his expectation, I mean. Sure. Yeah. Because, and so I think that uh, it's like a, a neglect in uh, our, our practice to avoid uh, to obtain this information, just to say, okay, I, I treat the stenosis, you, you can come back to your home and uh, stay and stay safe. <laughs> we would like just to say to the thing to the patient, but um, it's not so. 
is also the case in uh, in all the patients. So the more we can learn about uh, the microcirculation, uh, the more we can uh, uh, have uh, answer to to our practice. I think. Yeah, uh, sure. yeah. No, that will certainly come, and I can understand the, the value of that for uh, in in treating the patients, and that you have a, a full, uh, say, a better picture of really what the what the limitation could be. Um, I, I, we are coming to the end of the interview. Um, you also mentioned a couple of uh, applications that still require further validation, and uh, I understand that you're also very eager on on working. Uh, further on a couple of those validations, uh, among others, uh, left main disease, for example. And um, of course, we are looking forward to further work from your hands and further uh, publications. Yes. And, and uh, at this moment, I would uh, certainly like to thank you very much for this pleasant interview. Thank and you. I, I, I uh, wish you much success in, uh, in your research and the QFR applications. and. We'll hear from, from you again in the, the FAVOR 3 study and also in all the other applications that you are working on. So with that, um, thank you very much. Uh, I guess you still have to go back to work today. Uh, yes. <laughs> the patients and, uh, and we will be in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.